What's going on, Serial Progress Seekers? Marshall here. And on today's episode, I'm going to sit down with Ben and Tabitha to talk about something that's really top of mind for all of us all the time, and that's brand. So specifically, if you're actually looking for a way to truly lay a solid foundation for your brand and actually lay a foundation that's really based on something that makes people feel, then this episode is really going to shed a lot of light on how to do just that. This is episode 89 of the Serial Progress Seeker podcast. Let's go. Welcome to the Serial Progress Seeker podcast, where we share blueprints for building an unconventional life. Each week, we conduct expert interviews, talk strategies, and share advice for escaping the nine to five and building a life where you are free to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, all while making an excellent living. Okay, Serial Progress Seekers, let's get started with the show. All right, guys, as I was thinking about this topic that we're going to talk talk about here today, I started really thinking about some of the um, businesses, the brands that I kind of consider to be real experts in their field, you know, like the brands that you tend to trust, the, the ones that you kind of lean on. So I did some research beforehand and I came across this really cool thing that got put out by um, a, a, a publication called Morning Consult. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. It was, it was a new one for me, but um, it was a, they put out a cool yearly report about the most trusted brands in the United States. So I thought it'd be kind of cool to discuss these. So the very first one that's on this list, number one is the most trusted brands in the United States. Do you guys have a guess? you have any guesses? I don't. I have no, no? clue. I mean, I, I can think of a few. There's but so like, many, right? What There's do you so got? Many. Yeah. So number one, Band Aid. That makes sense. Band Aid. I mean, don't you trust that brand? I uh, I mean, it, trust it so much that um, you forget that not all bandages are called Band Aid. That's are right. not called Band Aids. You know, and they they're not all called that. That yeah. is an actual brand. So yeah, one hundred percent. I I get it. That's the, I mean, that's the way I feel about it, too. I was thinking about Band-Aid. I'm like, Band-Aid's one of those kind of like Kleenex, right? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's not called it's not called you're not reaching for a Kleenex. You're reach, reaching for a facial tissue. But they've right. done such an amazing job becoming that trusted brand. So, yeah, Band-Aid's number one. Number two was Lysol. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I see that up there. And check this. <laughs> number three was Clorox. So like Lysol and Clorox, two, three. Do you think we're coming off a global pandemic or something? Pandemic, no, yeah. it, it, it like starts to make sense real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. And then number number four and number five on that list. Number four was UPS. I really was. Uh, I was a little bit surprised by that. I'm not going to lie. Um, no. and, and then number five was CVS Pharmacy. Okay. Some, like some different all of those so kind of have to do with 2020. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. you're at no, home, you're ordering stuff, and UP or uh, yeah, UPS is the one that's bringing all your stuff from Amazon. So yeah, no, well, I absolutely love it. And that's I think I think it's going to be really interesting. We'll have to make sure to re- revisit this in like a year and see how it's changed. Because once you move past the pandemic stuff, who do we trust more at that point? I don't really know, but uh, it's a really really interesting list there. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, which brings us to today's topic, which right. is. Yeah. So what, what it is, is we've we've had this discussion a lot. Um, we get asked this a lot from from people that we interact with. And it, we thought we, this would be a really cool conversation to bring to the podcast because people are asking us all the time, how do I become an expert? Not only become an expert, but have other people see me as an expert which means how do I brand myself that way? So that's the biggest, biggest conversation. So when you think about how to brand yourself as an expert, just right off the cuff, what are some of the things you start thinking about? Uh, niching down. That's it. Uh, like, that's like, that's the biggest thing for me is the vast majority of people that I know that uh, are not seen as experts. It's because they fail to niche down. Hmm. Um, you know, coming up in the chiropractic world, uh, there were so, so many chiropractors that were so afraid of scaring business away by saying that I'm this kind of chiropractor or I serve this kind of patient. They were so scared of scaring people away that they wouldn't niche down within their own field. Mm. And um, they were just seen as another option. And that's all they were. Wow. And across the board, you know, that was probably the number one thing that I saw, you know, then and I see now as as I help a lot of, you know, small local based businesses is 
people are so scared of scaring away business that they never actually plant a flag in the sand and say, hey, not only am I this, but I am this specialized version of this. And that's it. When you when you go wide and you try to get as many people through the door as possible, it is almost impossible to be seen as an expert in anything. And so like the number one thing that I'm always telling people is I'm like, cool, well, you're a chiropractor, you're a dentist, you're this, you're that. Um, if it's not going the way that you want it to go right now, you have to really niche down within your field. And that is the quickest way for the world to start seeing you as something that is different. But more importantly, um, to start seeing you as a specific expert at something very, very specialized. And, and, and that's it. And, you know, outside of the marketing world, I think that's, that's what we say is like, uh, well, you know, niche or niche. Uh, like what, what, what does that even mean when you yeah. get out of this outside of the marketing world? Of course we know it, but it's like, you know, something completely different. Uh, what do you specialize in? What's your specialty? And that's what I ask a lot of our clientele when we go work with them. It's like, what, what, okay, well, you're a chiropractor. Great. <laughs> but what do you specialize in? What's your specialty within chiropractic? What's your specialty right. within dentistry? And that is before we get into anything else about like the deep, you know, psychology of uh, being seen as an expert, that really is the first thing that most people don't ever tackle in their entire career. And if they would just tackle it, that's a huge, huge piece of it. Well, and what's something that's cool about having the two of you on this conversation, Tabitha, you are literally an expert on brand. I see, I 100% see you that way. And I know Ben is, is the same way. So I think this conversation is going to be really good because you guys see it from that 30,000 foot view all the time. And so it's so hard, I think, for a lot of businesses, a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs out there to get off the ground from from being able to view things, right? They're so stuck in the weeds that they, they have a hard time kind of looking at that. Tab, do you, do you kind of agree with that? Yeah, a little bit. Although I find it funny that you guys call me an expert in branding because I'm like, I don't know that I would classify myself as that, but I do enjoy oh, it are, and I totally. do talk about it a lot. So <laughs> see, there you go. Well, and, and and honestly, and that's why I wanted that's where I wanted to kick us off today, because the way when I start thinking about branding, um, I, I, I think that there is a certain level of confidence that has to that has to that you have to start from. You have to have a serious foundation. So for someone to build that brand, how do you build your confidence? confidence so that you can feel like that you're actually an expert in your field. And I'll throw it out to either one of you because I, I know you both got uh, real feelings on that. So I would say you just got to start just like go just do something, talk about something, put something out there. Um, you can't be scared to fail on it. You've got to be able to start somewhere. And that's just putting some information out there, whether that be, you know, uh, an article, a video, uh, a graphic, anything like that. Just get your information out there. You got to start somewhere. I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of facing this um, from a from a hobby perspective right now where okay. I've, I've failed. I've really failed at this. And, you know, a lot of the frustration that I have within this hobby is because I've not done all of the things that in a professional setting that I do or I tell people to do. And so, like, when I go play music... All right. So for those of you that don't know, I am a really terrible musician that plays out live places like that's just something that I really enjoy. And it does not matter the level of skill that I think that I have or don't have uh, in the in the larger world. I enjoy it. And so what's what's really funny, though, is is when you get out and you start doing this, um, there's a real temptation to play to every room that you're in. Mm. So there's a there's a there's a temptation to get into a room that you're playing that night or that day and play to the room. And, and listen, as a musician, as an entertainer, that's what everybody says you're supposed to do. You're supposed to play to the room. That's true. Uh, but at the same time, there's there's definitely going overboard. And, and the problem is, is if you're playing to every single room that you ever show up in, because you got to try a lot of different rooms, is you end up being this generic thing that had, that is not memorable at all. People mm. can't classify you as anything. It's just, oh, well, they played a bunch of songs. They were a jukebox or... <laughs> they played some of this, they played some of that. And so one of the things is like that I've been really hardcore in that I think applies to a lot of businesses right now is we do that. We play, we try to play to everybody and we end up not being uh, specialized in anything because it is, it's, you just can't be specialized in anything. Yeah. And so the, in getting back into sort of this specializing and niching down, one of the things that I really have to talk myself into is like, you're going to bomb in some rooms. Like, if you play your game, you're going to bomb in some rooms, and that's okay. Yeah. But 
even if you bomb in those rooms and you were yourself and you were specialized and you were this thing, um, you're going to hit some rooms where you are going to become somebody's favorite thing that they've ever seen. Hmm. And that, that applies to business the same way. And so, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm getting back into show shape because uh, I, I took some time off because I fell and busted my face and my hands didn't work for a couple of months. But I'm getting yeah, back check, into show shape and right. Check the archives <laughs> for that one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have, a whole, we have a whole show on that. That's right. Uh, but I am getting into this spot right now where I'm looking at my set list and what I was playing and I'm, I'm looking at now and I'm like, have I absolutely gotten reaction out of an audience by playing this generic set? Sure. Because you were playing, you know, your sweet Carolines and you were playing your, you know, yeah. your covers that everybody can get behind. But honestly, that's just a, that's a jukebox. Like you could have a jukebox, you could have a phone and you could play sure. that. And that's, that's, it, there is nothing about that that makes somebody want to actually come back to your show other than, Hey, we can have a conversation pipe up every so often. That's not where they're coming back. So I had to, I had to take a real honest look at the set list and be like, what do I want to play? What if, if I'm the only one getting entertainment out of this uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I'm okay with that, what do I want to play? And being very open to me, there may be some venues that don't want to have me back because I'm doing that. There may be some venues that aren't into what I'm doing because the audience wasn't into that. It really didn't fit. But being completely okay with saying, if, if I want to do this thing the way that I want to do it, I'm going to have to really lock into who I am and specialize in a certain type of music. And that music has to be the thing that I actually want to do. And then I'm actually yeah. halfway decent at. And it's funny. When you really start looking at the things that you, you know, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't do real well with that tonight. It's always the stuff that's not you, right? Mm -hmm. And so taking that back to a business perspective, and I think that that's, that's really the case is it is so tempting. It is so, so tempting to play a role that somebody else in your community or that has a business like yours is playing. It's so tempting to try to appeal to everybody, but you cannot become an expert in your field in the eyes of anybody when you were playing the generic game, when you were trying to do everything or appeal to everybody. And I, I, the thing that a lot of people really, it sucks, but you're always kind to people in your business. You always try to do the best you can customer service wise, but there's just some people that never need to come in your business again because you don't fit them and you've got to be okay with that. And, and this is the really funny thing. And I think this is an interesting jumping off point. When you really commit to locking into just doing you and to niching down and saying, I only serve this kind of people within my field. And, and, you know, I will take care of other people. If they come in, I will do my best for them. But this is who I serve. This is my group of people. This is who I am excellent at serving. When you do that, you start to get really, really good at serving that group of people. Like you go from being, okay, I'm definitely better at this group of people and helping them than I am this group of people, or I'm better at like making things that this group of people likes. But when you really lock into that's who you are and that's what you say, that's when like you start going deep. Like yeah. so many people are like masters of like so many different things they think when they're not good at any of them. And the folks that really excel in business make one thing really well. Mm. That's it. Like how many, how many places do you guys, and I want to hear your answers. How many places can you guys name right now? And you don't have to actually name them. How many places can you name right now that you go into that business for one thing? It's that one thing that keeps bringing you back. And I mean, like it, all of my yeah. favorite things, all of my favorite restaurants, all of my favorite um, doctor's offices or, you know, clothing stores, you know, whatever it is, I go back there because they do one thing really well. They may be having some other things going on, but it's that one thing that brings me back that nobody else around actually does. And so when I think of experts, the first thing that I really do, and it's, it's exactly what I said in the beginning, it's, it's somebody that said, I'm not for everybody and that's okay. And um, I'm going to position myself in a way that the people that I am for, they're going to know that there is nobody else like me. Yeah. And you don't, you don't really ever have to think, if you think of it that way, you don't ever have to think about becoming an expert. You just have to think about, I am going to shut myself off to trying to be everything to everybody. And I think that is the foundational layer of what gets you there in a much easier way than thinking about, um, you know, how do I position myself and as an expert or like or become the expert? Because that's hard, because I think the trap that a lot of us get into when we get into that is we start thinking, oh, my God, there's so much to learn. There's so much that I'm going to have to learn. So th that's my start. And I think that I've really discovered how people get lost because us sitting here in our field right now, 
we very much dialed into our business side, who, who we're after and what we're doing. And, you know, every day we dial it in a little more. Um, but man, I tell you what, when I get into music, I start to understand where a lot of businesses get lost. And I find myself falling into a lot of the same traps that I see a lot of these businesses falling into too. So can I ask a question yeah, then? I think so. I, as, uh-oh. as somebody yeah, that was a business owner who was a chiropractor, who had that small business, how in the world did you decide how to niche down to like, how did you, I don't even remember what your niche was, but how do you go from seeing everything, this huge thing and narrowing it down to what it is that you're wanting to, to niche down to? <laughs> yeah. It was, it was funny uh, because it was, it was actually done for me in the beginning. I had a lot of, and for whatever reason, I had a lot of females, 25 to 35 that um, responded to our marketing out of the gate. Oh, we know um, the reason. I don't even, we know the reason. Uh, Come on. I don't feel like Come it on. was, no, no, no. It was, <laughs> Uh, what I think it actually was is the particular community that I started in, the, the people that were active in the business community was nice. that, okay. um, it, you know, a lot of the male sides, it was not as dominated by males as there's, there was females that were showing up, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So females yeah. 25 to 35 were really busting their butts to make their way and to get out there and get known. And so like I was out there trying to get known too. So in the beginning I had a lot of females 25 to 35 that were coming through the door. And what I started to realize is I was also getting their husbands to come in. I was also getting their kids to come in and I was also getting their dads and moms to come in. And so what it was really interesting is, is I had a very diverse patient base, which, you know, could be hard for someone to say that I had niched down. But what I focused on was I focused on marketing to females 25 to 35. I leaned into it and I was like, yeah. what can we do to attract this group of people and to let them know that even though I'm not a female myself, and I had some female chiropractors that were around me that like very much leaned into that niche because sometimes it's just easier to go see somebody that is, you know, a, a female too. Uh, but I wasn't that, but I, I did a, a really, a really conscious effort to make it feel safe into my office. And to have other staff members that were around to make that demographic feel safe. Because if they felt safe, they were referring others um, that were in that same demographic, but they were also bringing everybody else in. So what we got really good at, um, and this is probably why we had a massage, a dedicated massage therapist in our office. This is probably why my entire, my entire staff at the time was female, minus me, um, was just because we were doing everything we possibly could to lean into that. Now, I never came out and had to say specifically, I only treat these people because I didn't. Mm -hmm. But very much our marketing, all the money that we spent on marketing, everything was aimed at that demographic to make our office more attractive to them and to make them feel like we were going to get them where they needed to go health-wise. And it's funny, the rest sort of took care of itself. I, I, you know, because we niche down at that. And like I said, I think sometimes people think, well, if you niche down, you're not going to get any of these other people. That's not the case at all. Right. But that, that's what I did, Tabitha. That was such a good question. But I, well, I very I, much go ahead. I was no, I was just thinking I, it wasn't just some some idea that you had in your head. It was from actual research and trying things and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Bef- and that's what led you in that direction. It wasn't just some random guess in the dark. No. It was um, what came in, what came through the door. And honestly, who was I the most comfortable with talking to when they came through the door? And for some reason, I was... You got to enjoy what you're right. doing, yeah. I was very comfortable with that demographic. Because at the time, I was uh, between the ages of like 27 to 33. And so, you know, right around my age group. Um, and so that demographic of 25 to 35 females, um, for some reason, it was easy for me to talk to them. And we, you know, I was the most comfortable with that patient. And when they came through the door, that's who I was most comfortable with. So as I started getting into this stuff as to like, okay, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I really started to say, well, you know, this is who I'm the most comfortable with. And it doesn't have to be, mine doesn't have to be someone else's, but when you figure out who you're the most comfortable with, who you have the best life, take a look at your entire subset of what you've done in the first year to two years of your business and say, who are my favorites? Who are the people that like charge me up when they walk through the door? How do I get more of them? And then when you lean into that, you will get more of them. And also when you lean into that, you become better at serving them. And so like that, that was it for me. It's like, no, it wasn't a shot in the dark. I didn't know what I was doing at first. I just knew how to get people better. And after a year or two, I knew this is who I really enjoyed having conversations with the most. And they were the most positive overall, not, not, not across the board, of course, but 
that demographic was the most positive. Plus, that demographic was the demographic that seemed the most concerned with the success of my business as well. Mm. And so that's that's what led me down that path and ha- helped me to really lean in. Well, you know, essentially what you were doing, what you're talking about is you're you're slowly at that point, you're defining your brand, right? And that's and I think that kind of parlays exactly into what I wanted to kind of get into next was think think back to that time, Ben and, and Tab, you think on this too, but as you're defining your brand, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, what are some of those serious basic questions or maybe not even basic, maybe even a little past surface level? What are those kind of questions that I need to be asking myself to help me define it if I'm having trouble defining my exact brand? And then once you do that, how do I how do I take it to the next level and start really establishing a presence? <sighs> Yeah, Tab, no, you want to go first? That's a, that's a deep you one. You want to go first? <laughs> no, I'll, right off the bat, my brain doesn't go to that question. It's can we define what a brand is first? Because most people, uh, when they think of a brand, they think of a logo, and that is not at all what a brand is. Yeah, so how a do you A brand is what someone else – so a brand is what someone else thinks of – and feels when they think about your business. So it's not a thing. It's not tangible. It's how it's an emotion. It's a feeling. So yeah. what, when somebody thinks of your chiropractic office, your dentist office, or whatever business you've got, how do they think of you? That is your brand. It's, it's whatever conjures up in their brain and their emotions. That's what a brand actually is. So it's not a logo. It's not a tagline. It's not the people it's, it's an emotional feeling. So, yeah, well, and, you know, and I, I to piggyback off that, too, I think that a lot of times we put pressure on ourselves and we don't start quick enough or we don't dive in quick enough because we think we've got to have all this figured out right away. Um, and I think a brand is a living thing. You know, it's it's an absolute living thing. So right. the beginning of, of my chiropractic office, the beginning of Serial Progress Seeker, you're already starting to see, like, let's take a pause here. Serial Progress Seeker starts off as an idea. And the idea is that, you know, How do you live this abnormal but extraordinary lifestyle that you can run from a laptop and a phone and a backpack, right? And color-wise, it was me. Like that logo, that, uh, that, that color out of the gate, I knew out of the gate that like I didn't know exactly who I was aiming at, but I was like, this is this is what I want my life to be like. So this is gonna be the brand. I think there's some other people out here that are kind of like that. But over time, and, and I think this is key. I don't think you can actually figure out what your brand is about or have even a good idea within the first one, two, three years. Like it takes time. And, you know, a lot of times we won't even work with the business in our agency until they're at least three years old because like we want them to have those things solidified and really start to understand. Now, I think it takes another probably five to 10 years to really get it. But I think the idea is is you've got to be open. This is our foundation. This is what we're about, but evolving. And so if you pay any attention to anything that I've put out lately, like you're going to start to see, like I have become more of this person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. Like the colors that appeal to me, the things that sort of lock in. And, you know, what's interesting about that is I'm starting to learn more about who our customers actually are when they're not trying to tell me a story. <laughs> mm. And um, and I'm enjoying it. I think that's the other side is, is as our customers have started to come out of the woodwork and, and talk to me more, um, we're starting to enjoy it a lot more. And I'm enjoying that this Serial Progress Seeker brand is starting to evolve out of what I thought that it was when we started or what it, not what I thought it was, but what it actually was when we started versus what it is now. And so, you know, I'm starting to figure out who is actually listening to us, what they actually feel when they hear the things that we're already talking about. Not that I'm having to talk about anything different, but what they're actually feeling and they're giving me feedback. And it's not like I consciously was like, oh, we're shifting to more of this color or we're shifting out of the red and the white. You know, I still think that's a core part of who we are. Um, But as we're starting to see feedback, I'm starting to see these weird things start to slip in and integrate themselves into our brand. And so to to actually answer your question. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that once you start establishing, once you start getting that feedback from the people that are actually interested in what you're doing, you have these things where like, you don't throw the baby out with, you know, the bathwater, you keep your foundation, but you really start enjoying other pieces of what your brand lends to your life and what your customers are giving you. And it just slips in. 
it just yeah. starts to slip in and then you start to get this really good house that's built on top of the foundation that you laid in the first place. And that's the thing. What your initial logo is, what your initial colors are, what your initial, what Tabitha actually said was what you think people are going to feel about you when you put products out before you start. What that starts is that's just the foundation. But what's really interesting is the house that gets built on the foundation. And that is where you understand the house is always intimately tied to the foundation, the foundational brand that was there. But you're actually going to end up living in the house that gets built on top of it. And that is typically a story that gets told to you by your customers, that gets shaped by your customers. And that's what's super interesting is like, as we're sort of getting into this, you know, and I like the concept of serial progress seeker has been with me for a while, but we're really sort of hitting that three to five year mark for us. And that's why I'm really starting to understand who we actually are as a group uh, that work together, but also as our listeners. And thank goodness our listeners have been so good at communicating back with us and telling us, you yeah. know, what they're all about. And so I, I agree with Tabitha 100%. It is what, it's not logo, it's not colors, it's what your customers feel yeah. when they think about you. Yeah. And you can guess at that before you start, but when you actually get into the mix, if you don't lean into it, uh, you're crazy, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, Tabitha and I are always real big on as much as possible. All the stuff that we put out there has to fit a certain, you know, uh, uh, it has to fit within the brand. Feel. Uh, but I think that, yeah, yeah it's got to yeah. have that feel. Um, but I think that's the cool thing is like we, you know, we've been really, really open to growing what that actually is. And that's feedback. That is 100% feedback yeah. from people. So, you yeah, know, it I, should, your, your brand should never be stagnant. It should never be the same. Three right. years from when it started, it shouldn't be the same six years after that. It should it could should constantly be changing and morphing as it grows and, and changes with you and with your customers and all of that. And, you know, you get into things like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and, you know, Apple, um, you get into these monster brands. Um, and I think that there are elements to this day that exist in all of their branding that were there in the beginning, like when yeah. they had no idea who they were. You know, they were really just getting started, but there's been this constant evolution um, that is integrated into that. And that that's the house that got built on top of the foundation that they laid very early on. Um, and yeah, like that that's where I think everybody that is really trying right now is you don't have to have it all figured out in the beginning. You have to have an idea. You have to have an idea that, you know, you talk to your friends, your family, your maybe a small group of customers, and you say, this is kind of what I'm thinking. If they respond well to it, cool, you got a foundation. But understand, you got to build something on that foundation. And over the years, you're going to have trees grow. You're going to expand that house. Um, you're going to have all these things that happen. And you've got to be open to organically letting it turn to what it's going to turn into because what it turns into is by far more satisfying than what you came up with in a dark room one day uh, that was going to be <laughs> the beginning of it all. And um, I think that that's the thing is when you're willing to lean into it, you turn your brand into something that is amazing. And that that is when you get this level of authority that nobody else on the planet can duplicate. It's because your audience has helped you shape it into something that is something that they want, um, but also something that it, that you want. And when those two things meet in the middle, magic happens. Absolutely. I'm really glad you let us down that road, Tabitha, because it, you're 100% right when you talk about the logo thing. It's, it's, and it's so easy for us, you know, as, as, as brand marketers and, and entrepreneurs to be focused on the pen and paper of it all. But it's it's when we can really get in touch with things is when we get in touch with those feelings, those emotions of a brand. And that's, that's really where we kind of take it to the next level. So when we, so let's put branding to the side for just a second. And we start to get to where say, say we're, say we're in a pretty solid spot on branding. We feel pretty good about where we, where we fit into our market. Um, and we're working on establishing a presence. How do you begin to, and what are the things you need to focus on when you start to think about things like content? You already touched on it a little bit. When you start thinking, thinking about, you know, establishing social media and putting blogs out and recording videos, things like that, as you're starting to do that stuff, what, what are the kind of things you need to keep in mind that starts to show that, you really have expertise in your said field. For me, I think that I talk about the things that I'm interested in on social media and I watch the numbers every week. That's it. And 
you can't you can't get away from the brand conversation actually um, because what happens is is nothing evolves if you don't put yourself out there. It doesn't. You know, if you're sitting in the dark room, you know, doing stuff yourself, putting stuff out there, and you're ignoring what's coming back, nothing changes, and the brand will die. But if you're putting things out there and you're listening to what people are telling you back, something interesting happens. So I had a buddy this week, and he posted this, and it was very, very interesting to me. He's he's into the AI stuff. Now, he is really interested in it. He's not on it just because it, uh, it's a trend right now. He is in it to win it. Like, he loves this stuff. Yeah. But he said this. He said, it took me 14 years to get to a million views on my YouTube channel. It took me another week to get to 2 million. And this is what's so amazing about this. I've watched him over the last month, month and a half. And when he, when he, and he talks about all this stuff, he's been a podcaster for years. He's one of my favorite podcasters out there. And he talks about all this stuff and he's talked about this stuff for years, but he had this topic that he was, you know, talking about on and off. And all of a sudden, you know, he was watching his numbers and he was watching the feedback that people were getting and, and people were into this. And yes, some of it's because it's AI is, is trending right now, but he was really into it too. And his audience was telling him, Hey, we want more of this. We want you to talk about more of this. And so as he was putting out lots of different kinds of content, the numbers were telling him, we like this part of you a lot. Do you want to keep talking about this? Cause we want more of it. And so he leaned in and mm everything that he has put out lately is about this topic and that's how it took him 1 million you know 1 million views took him 14 years the second million took him a week because when he was putting out content there was content that didn't go as well and that was okay and i think the thing when he when it comes to content the strategy number one in the beginning is just put out content often and understand that a lot of your content is going to fall on its face and that's okay. But put out a lot of different kinds of content that surround the interest that you're in and see what actually takes off. And when you start to really look at the numbers and see what takes off, you're going to get there. We don't have, and I, I heard, um, <laughs> you know, I heard a, a very famous music producer that just put out a book uh, <laughs> not too long ago say, we don't really have a problem with, uh, musicianship out there. We, we don't have that problem. You know, we don't have a problem with people being good musicians. That that's There's no shortage of good musicians. And even when you're not a good musician, there's no shortage of interesting people that can barely play, but they're st- so interesting that you can't stop watching them. There's no shortage of that. What there's a shortage of is work ethic. Now, let me tell you, if you know this uh, particular uh, music producer, and I'm not going to say their name, but we'll link to them, it is looks like one of the laziest people on the planet. Um, big white beard, um, doesn't wear shoes, meditates before, you know, like it is the most chill out sort of, uh, situation on the planet, but work ethic. That was what he cited. He says, most musicians have zero work ethic when it comes to their career. And what you take out of that is when it comes to content, it is incredibly hard to put something out every day. It's incredibly hard to put out multiple things per day. And that's tough. But if you want to see your brand grow, you keep doing what the Velociraptors were doing in the original Jurassic Park movie. They were testing <laughs> the fence. They were testing the electric fence to see where the weaknesses are so they could get through it. And it, you know, damn it, those dinosaurs have inspired me since that movie came out. <laughs> they kept getting shocked, literally electric shocks, to find the weak point in the fence so they could get out of this fence. And I think that's it. I think that that is the whole game is... We have the best opportunity that we have ever had to grow businesses. You know, from a perspective of being a musician, I can put my music right alongside Taylor Swift's music. She has this giant marketing machine, this giant, you know, production machine behind her, and I can get access to the same distribution channels that she has. I can get access to a lot of the same recording techniques that she has. There is no shortage of people that I can send my music to that'll mix it for me, that'll master it for me. There's no shortage of this. When it comes to business, there is no shortage of access, cheap access to people that can create content for you. There's no shortage of access to equipment that you can do this stuff. Guys, we're sitting in our houses right now recording this thing that's going to go out to millions of people. We are on the same podcasting distribution channels as 
every major podcaster out there. We have all this opportunity, but are you actually putting the content out? Are you actually doing it? You know, it's not easy to sit here some days and show up and deliver content. It's not easy to do the things that you have to do, but you do it. Because if you treat it like a job, a job that hopefully you enjoy, you find your way. It's being consistent. It's not about where you're going. It's about the process. And so I think that's it from a content perspective. And I want to hear what Tabitha has to say about this because Tabitha is in the thick just as much as I am. And you are, Marshall, with this, but especially with social content. Um, I think that it is about consistency, showing up, and just getting it out there. But also not just getting it out there and not paying attention to what happens, watching what happens with the content. If you pay attention to your numbers, your audience will tell you what to do next. And I think that's key. Tabitha, what do you think? Would agree with that all a thousand percent. But on top of that, I would say whatever content that you're putting out there, you've got to make sure that your customer and your people that you're talking to has to be number one on your mind. Whatever you're putting out there has to be something that's going to be beneficial to them. Either, you know, teach them something new, motivate them, inspire them, whatever it is that you're doing, as long as you're putting them first and not yourself first. If you're putting yourself and your vanity and and I just want to get content out there and I've got to do it every day, it's going to it's going to flop on its face. Uh, but if you're putting your viewers first and before you put anything out there, you stop and you think, is this actually going to help somebody better their lives in one way or another, then you're going to see success and you're going to see what's going to work. And like Ben said, watching the numbers, making sure that what it is that you're saying is matching those things and, and getting it out there. So that would be, I mean, everything you said was accurate. I would just say, make sure that whatever you put out there is, is um, aimed at them for the right reasons. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we actually shared a TikTok um, that we saw this week. Um, I think I shared it with you guys um, that was talking exactly about what you're talking about. It says, stop treating people as these faceless people that you're trying to reach. Start treating them like they're part of a private Facebook group that you just happen to be the head of, that you're the admin of, and that they're, that you're, you're, they're your people. And really think about like who these people are, because like you see their names, like, and you know them. And I think that, you know, from a position of like being an authority and having confidence, you know, I really try to go into every single situation thinking that, okay, there's real people on the other end, but these are people that like, they're not here to hurt me. You know, these are my people. Mm -hmm. And Every time I walk into a new place, whether I'm doing it for work or I'm doing it for, you know, just for me, I try to walk in thinking that like, uh, there are friends hiding here. There are new Mm -hmm. friends. There are new people that are going to be in my life for the rest of my life hiding here that I'm going to have an experience. And I can't tell you guys like how many people that like, even if I've only actually hung out with them one time, they are significant in my life because of that one time. And so in every piece of content that you put out there, really thinking about who's on the other end and really thinking about what they need, um, what you're interested in, obviously, and what you're an expert in, or you feel like you're an expert in, uh, but what do they need and how do you give them what they need so that, you know, you can bring them into that friend place. And far too many people out there are trying to be like famous. That's a shit way to go about this. That is an absolute terrible way to go about what we're doing. What you were trying to do is actually get conversations started. You know, I love, I love, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to transition. Like I was very good for years on Facebook, like responding to everything that people would say back to me, but like all the other networks, not so good sometimes. And so like, I love when I go to a page of a hugely popular creator and Gary Vee is a perfect example of this. Like, I don't know how the guy does it, but he does it and he does it well. He tries to respond to every comment. And that that's, that's it right there, right? Like when you are tired of trying to stand up on the tallest stage and have people cheer at you and you're trying to be down in the middle of this crowd of people all having the same conversation and and like conversing and going back and forth. That's when you explode. That's when everything that you're trying to do. He doesn't do it. Right. He does it because he actually cares about his viewers. I mean, like he wants to see everyone succeed and that's why it worked for him. And that's why it's not work for him. Like he's enjoying it. He's responding to everybody because it's not work. You know, he's just doing what he loves. Yeah. And I, and I, 
I, I, I love that. And I think that that's it is when you, when you come at it from that, I think far too many of us, well, we're doing the TikTok because we want to blow up and get in front of as many people as possible and be famous and grow our brand and get more people on our list. And no, you want to do content because you think it might help somebody. Like it is, mm-hmm. it's your content is drastically different when you're putting together content that will actually help somebody. And I think that that's, that's the thing that like, it's so tempting sometimes to go create a piece of content that you know is going to blow up because this sound is blowing up or this topic is blowing up. But like the views don't matter if you don't make an impact. And I think that's the thing is like, there's so many people that aren't making a real impact that it's sometimes a lot easier to make an impact if you're just coming at it the right way. So agree hundred percent. I think that you've got to get in there and you've got to really think about how am I talking to my people, my group? How do I find more friends that are into the same topics as me rather than I'm going to stand up on this stage and preach, um, that doesn't work anymore. (laughs) You know, we are, we are make the world around you a better place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, if you can come at it and you can continually come at it. I think that's the thing. Some people are like, well, I put out some content that did that. And like, it didn't really fly. Are you doing it consistently? Are you showing up every week? That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. That is Mm -hmm. what it takes. You do that. You watch the numbers. You come at it from the right perspective and good things happen. So I got to tell you what I'm hearing here, guys, it's, it's funny because we're, We're having a conversation about how to brand yourself as an expert in your field, but it almost sounds like we need to kind of shift that a little bit. Instead of that, instead of worrying about that crap, worry about branding yourself as someone who's willing to help people. And that's, that's something that we've woven into the very fabric of serial progress seeker. And I think, you know, maybe that's just a, maybe that's, it's worth it for us to shift this entire conversation in that direction, because that's what we believe. And we feel like, and all the people that, that we see on the crowd around us, just like you were just talking about are doing the same thing. And we're all working towards the same piece. I kind of, I think it's a real nice harmonious place to be. Yeah. I mean, to really simplify, how are you extremely useful to the smallest group of people um, that you can be useful to. And it's funny how it just blows up into something huge when you do that. Like it seems so counterintuitive, but how can you become useful to a really small group of people and it explodes? And like I said, I I always go back to the Apple example. Apple was not for everybody Yeah. for an incredibly long amount of time. Like decades, Mm -hmm. Apple was not for everybody. And that is why they exploded to do literally one of the biggest brands on the planet is because for years, all they did was they had this small group of people that really wanted to do something that they couldn't do with any other piece of equipment. And they built for them. Now they charged, you know, they charged an expensive price for this because this was a smaller group of people and they, and it took care and it took money to build these products that way, but they focused on them. And they built this rabid, rabid group of fans that from the day they started are still fans. And, and that's people are like, oh, well, why are you such an Apple fanboy or fangirl? Why are you so into them? It's because for a very, very long time, that brand was only the only place you could find this thing. It was right. it. There was no other place for it. And they were able to take that initial success and parlay it into the brand that we actually know today. But I think that's the other side of it too is – be patient, be patient and be consistent and understand that you don't have to rule the world today. You just have to start. You have to get yourself out there. You have to have a foundation to stand on, which you get to decide what is that foundation. And that should be based on your family and friends and what your first customers say that they love about you. But then be very open to, I'm not for everybody. I'm serving this one group of people and I'm going to serve them the best that I can. I'm going to go deep instead of trying to go wide. And as that evolution happens, being very open to understanding what that foundation that you laid, what you know, what were the initial colors for your brand that you thought was there? What was the initial logo? What was that? How do you take that foundation and you expand it into something that is really something you could have never dreamt up by yourself? And if you're open to that experience, you keep showing up and you're willing to put in 10 years. Nobody wants to hear that, right? Everybody wants the overnight (laughs) success. Everybody wants to succeed in the first year. But if you're willing to say, I'm going to build something that's going to be good enough this first year, I'm going to build something that's going to be pretty stinking good the first three years. And I'm going to really catch my stride with this because I'm going to pay attention 
to what my customers are telling me. And I'm going to be okay with not bringing everybody in for the first 10 years. If you're willing to do that, you absolutely have a shot to build something that is completely world changing, that is going to go far beyond you, is going to outlive you. Um, and I think that's it. But even if it doesn't, you've still built something that is special to a group of people that they will never forget. And you can make a whole lot of money doing that. You could be very, very happy doing that. And you can kind of live life on your terms doing that. And isn't that the point? Yeah, it's like an amen, right? Tap? I feel the same. It's uh, I, it's funny. <laughs> Brand in general, good grief, such an amazing topic and something we could literally rap about for hours and hours and hours. Um, I it It's funny because I when I was thinking about this topic, guys, I was thinking about the fact that, I mean, rewind, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, it feels like the word brand even felt different back then. Um, used to, it's like, it almost used to be a part of a vocabulary of like a subculture, but in, in today's world and, 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 you know, mass media and social media and things like that, everyone is so consumed with brand and, and we're all, everyone's so obsessed with it. Um, and so I'm really glad that we had to me a little bit of a deeper conversation about, uh, and, and I can't, I keep getting stuck on what Tab said. I'm, again, I'm so glad that you said it because I keep getting stuck on the, you know, sitting at your computer, pen and paper version of a brand is is not what you need to be focusing on. It's it's, it's not at all. So I, I, I think that's so good. And, and I'll leave it to you guys to kind of close this down because I, I think it's just a, a great, a great thought that we can leave everybody with. Well, you know, I think that's the thing is like the only, the only experience that I can give you is, is, is I'll close with how Serial Progress Seeker started. We had been operating for five, six years. Um, we were not Serial Progress Seeker yet, okay? Um, but I'd been operating, running a very similar business for five or six years that went through probably three different name changes. And I just, I kept talking about things that I enjoyed doing and it was, you know, it was marketing based, it was lifestyle based. And I had these customers that just kept coming back and they had been with me from the very beginning and they just kept spending money with me. They kept talking to me and I really listened to what was important to them and what they were trying to achieve in their life by buying my products and being a supporter of what, what I was doing. And I looked at like, what do I want my life to look like in the next few years? And Serial Progress Seeker was important to me because what they kept telling me and what I thought, this is who I am too, is I didn't want to be somebody that stopped evolving. You know, I, I didn't want to be somebody that was stuck in a career in an office for years. I didn't want to be somebody that had the same job for 40 years. I don't even think that's going to exist soon. I, I didn't want to be that person that was there. But I also wanted to be mobile. I wanted to travel. I wanted to experience life. And from what I kept hearing back from my customers, that was it. And so Serial Progress Seeker, became sort of the mantra before it became a logo in and in a, the name yeah. of a business. It was really our, what this, me and this group of people were all about. And then, you know, when the little walking man uh, or boy, whatever you want to call it, came into the, the sort of the world, and that didn't exist at first. That was just a piece that got added to it. And this is what I mean by evolution. Yeah. When that got added to it, it was because... Most of the people that I talked to, that was part of what they want to do. They wanted to be able to work from anywhere, you know, and they didn't want to have a brick and mortar building necessarily. They had been down that road and they had experienced that. They didn't want that anymore. They wanted to be able to go work from a coffee shop. They wanted to be able to go on vacation without having to not check in, you know, but also it not dominate their vacation. Right. And so that's where that came from. And so, you know, we launched Serial Progress Seeker to, um, you know, it, it just felt like a natural thing because that's what our customers were telling us that they, who they were and who they wanted to be. And that's more, I wanted to move more towards that direction every single day. But now, you know, the things that are really starting to, do, starting to dominate Serial Progress Seeker are number one, we're starting to see a new customer base come in. You know, we're starting to see new folks that look a little different than what we had those first five years come in. And I think that that's because, um, of the pandemic, number one, I think people have shifted their mindsets. And so we've got more people thinking in different ways. But I also believe that a lot of people are telling us exactly what they want to hear and what's the most important thing for them right now is how do I have that that foundational lifestyle that we talked about and we've been talking about for years? How do I do that? But how do I do it this way? 
how do I do it this specific way? Because this specific way is what I'm very, very into. And so, you know, the products that we're creating right now, the software that we're investing our money into building for ourselves and for our customer base very much reflects what people are telling us that they need the most that they're not getting from anywhere else. And so, you know, it's an evolution, but I think more importantly than anything, and Tabitha said it, Marshall, you've hit on it a few times. It's all about, are you having a conversation with the people that are spending money with you? And are you actually listening? That's it. That, that's the whole thing. We all have that friend who keeps getting in bad relationships and we keep telling them how not to uh, because they keep asking for our advice. And we keep telling them how to avoid this and they keep not listening. No, we don't want to go back there. You know, like that's not a, that's not a good brand. Um, but what's really great is the best brands, they are having conversations with their consumers. They are having conversations with their customers and they're actually listening. Now, we're not talking about listening to just one person. We're talking about what is the overall dominating conversation that is being had in this tribe that is your customer base. And when your customers are telling you something, you listen. And that is how you evolve. And I think where Serial Progress Seeker came from, where it is now, and where it's going to be in the next year versus the next five and 10 years, that is the ball game for us. And I think that's the investment that we're all kind of making is like all of us sitting here, things are going to evolve, our lives are going to change, but we like, we like a lot of elements of where we are now. It's just how do we, how do we continue to evolve that in a direction um, that is more comfortable for us because we're more speaking from within our skin and at the same time, uh, we've got a customer base that is buying from us and listening to us because, you know, it's the skin that they are in or it's the skin that they want to be living in. And I think that that is how you make it. It's, it's about the conversation. It's about listening. But it's about understanding that you can only have that really high quality conversation with a small group of people. So focus on that small group of people and really deliver something that nobody else on the planet is willing to deliver because everybody else is trying not to scare customers away. And it's okay. It's okay to scare them away because really, really good things start to happen when people know that you stand for something and you're one of the only people on the planet that stands for that. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of the Serial Progress Seeker podcast. If you want to listen to more episodes, learn more about our mission, or send us questions or feedback about the show, go to SerialProgressSeeker.com. You can help the mission by subscribing, reviewing, rating, and commenting wherever you listen to or watch podcasts.